Papa Joe, founder of Elijah's Heart and Walk of Love. Welcome to Signature Required. It's great to be here, Spencer and Carly. Yeah. We are so thrilled to have you and to hear your voice for even a second and certainly to see you is to know immediately that you have a very special heart and a heart that I am so excited to showcase today. Known by many as Papa Joe, you were born and raised in Nashville. You moved into one of Nashville's most impoverished communities where you and your wife, Denise, began supporting dozens of children who sought your guidance and care. Embracing this role, you founded Elijah's Heart and Walk of Love, nonprofits dedicated to providing resources and food to children in need. You were an honors student at UT and an early hacker, which ultimately landed you in prison. <laughs> That's a good one to start with. Uh, <laughs> two, Napier Sudicum, where you live and work, is one of Nashville's largest food deserts. Number three, Walk of Love, led by you and Denise for over 20 years, is a hunger relief program. Number four, your story was adapted into the Hollywood film Unconditional in 2012. And five, you battled a rare kidney disease and are a kidney transplant recipient. <laughs> yeah, how does one yeah. go from hacking to food deserts? Like, what is, yeah. what is the journey there? Yeah, well, as you said, I was one of the... Uh, uh, as you say, in the early 80s, uh, I've been young for a long time, guys. In the early 80s, I was an honor student in, in my senior year at UT, I tutored three programming languages. And uh, so by day, I was an all-American kid. But by night, I was one of the original computer hackers and had a job waiting on me uh, at IBM, high-paying job. Wow. And... Um, I wrote a program for an airline to uh, determine how many flights to overbook, you know, I mean, seats to overbook a flight. And so they, uh, you know, my, I, I got interviews all over the country because I, that was a successful program, saved millions of dollars for this airline, okay? So they wanted to hire me in various places. But on a day or right before I graduated, uh, I hacked into a bank. Is when the ATM systems first came out. And I just wanted to, I, you know, it was a dare. And so the dare got me in trouble. I got, I got caught, not in the hack, but there was a hidden camera. So, yeah. So I didn't get to go to college. I ended up going into uh, doing some time. Wow. Yeah. And it changed the whole tra tra trajectory of my, uh, my life. Mm -hmm. That is an <laughs> unbelievable twist of a story. So <laughs> you're hacking in the 80s. That's like when computers were the size of rooms oh, at yeah. that point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How did you have that background and knowledge and interest to become a hacker. I was a co-op student at Eastman Kodak and the systems manager for their computer system. Eastman Kodak was in Kingsport, 14,000 uh, employees at the time. So I basically uh, uh, shadowed the systems manager. And I, you know, everything on the computer just about was on the IBM mainframe. So I, I became very inept at the IBM mainframe, yeah. <laughs> So you did time, mm -hmm. and then you came out, and what was next for you? Yeah. It sounds like you didn't go back to coding or hacking, a life of hacking. What was your next step? Well, the irony, uh, one of my first jobs when I got out was a computer operator at Shoney's Incorporated. I literally uh, uh, programmed uh, com the computer system to print the checks nationwide for um, – uh, Shoney's Incorporated. I printed ten million dollars in cashable checks every week. <laughs> the I, irony behind it. I that. mean, coming out of prison for having <laughs> hacked into a bank server yeah. is pretty. And phenomenal. then go right back <laughs> to computing and sending yeah. out millions of dollars of checks. That's exactly. Wow. What was that like in the moment of being caught on a dare? Did you feel like the punishment that you received was commensurate for what had happened? Because I I kind of hear this in some way of saying, all right, you're a young man, and you're clearly brilliant, in this case, more brilliant than your own good, I think, <laughs> exactly. and you get caught doing this, and how long did you serve? I, I was given eight years at 30%. Now, I served a year and a half. At one point, in one of the jails, I taught the sheriff how to use uh, their computer system. And so I was giving good time to everybody, and so I got a lot of favor. 
you know, that, you know, in that. And so, but I don't believe, I, I believe I got uh, the amount of time, not because of what I did, but for the potential of what I could do. The movie called War Games came out during that time, if anybody's ever seen that. I have. And, yeah. And uh, let's just say judges didn't like hackers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that was when it was especially mysterious yeah. of, like, you don't know if you could hack in and launch nukes, right? Exactly. I mean, that's the war game's whole concept is just exactly what could you do. Okay. So you're working for Shoney's and printing all of the checks. Mm-hmm. What brought you – where were you living? Were you back in Nashville? Yeah, I was in Nashville at the time. This was in Nashville. I moved to uh, Nashville from Knoxville uh, because my gr- my grandmother was uh, – who raised me more than my mother, actually. She was dying of cancer. As soon as I moved here, she died within months. So I'm, I'm here in Nashville by myself. But I did meet uh, my what was going to be my wife uh, at a temporary job because I worked at Shoney's and a temporary job. I met what was going to be my wife. Her name is Denise at that temporary job. So I kind of got uh, stuck here in Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> so advance the story from there. What is your career trajectory looking like to ultimately land you into Elijah's heart and walk of love? What's next? I, at the time I was working, um, you know, when I was working at Shoney's in temporary job, I eventually got a job for the state of Tennessee. And it was going pretty well. And uh, my wife and I, you know, well, we ended up getting married. Let's put it that way. And uh, had two children, little children. And uh, one day uh, my legs started swelling. And um, I thought I was just gaining weight. I, I grew up with chicken legs, so I was pretty proud of my legs, wearing <laughs> short shorts everywhere. <laughs> But on my 35th birthday, uh, I think it was, uh, and by that time, it landed me in the hospital. And I was there for two weeks. And this was uh, years later, you know, not too long after we got married. Um, and um, I had a rare kidney disease. Mm. And they, they didn't know what caused it or what cured it. So they told me I was going to lose my kidneys in three years. But three months later, I lost my kidneys. Oh, my God. And ended up on a machine nine hours a day wow. yeah so that that's where i ended up so i didn't get to work i had to quit i was on disability so here we are yeah just in an apartment about to be kicked out and that's right before we moved into the inner city mm-hmm. wow so like a second iteration of all the promise in the world unbelievably brilliant strapped to a hospital bed Nine hours a day. Is that di- dialysis? It was dialysis. It was, it, yeah, peritoneal dialysis. So, yeah, nine hours and 24 hour period. With yeah. two little kids. Now you yeah. have eight children, but at the time. At the time, we had two, two little children. And, uh, yeah. And so, if I moved on, eventually, you know, I was on that machine for a year and a half. And a kidney transplant came available, but the doctor suggested that I didn't take it because I had a sclerosis disease which is a killing of the kidney cells. So they say if you, if you get the uh, transplant, it's going to kill the new kidney. Mm. And so I, uh, I had a dilemma. I had a dilemma because I was very, very sick. I was getting uh, kidney stones, all kinds of things, you know, over and over. They wanted to remove both my kidneys that were not working because of the, the kidney stones. But a, a transplant, came, a kidney came available. And uh, it was a poor match, a very poor match. So I had to choose between getting my kidneys, uh, having that operation, and both of them taken out, or getting a new kidney that was a poor match. Yeah, that was my choice. But there's a reason why I chose to get the kidney. Tell us. My oldest son, who's my oldest son now, he was three years old at the time. And uh, if I can say this, uh, I'm just going to say it. He, he said, Daddy, Jesus will heal you. And so I said, I'm sorry, son, but you don't understand. I can't be healed of a sclerosis disease. And he said, Jesus will heal you. So everything, everything, every time I came back with a debate, he would say, Jesus will heal you. So I went on to faith of my three-year-old to get the transplant. <laughs> wow. I love that. From the mouth of babes. Mm-hmm. So how'd the transplant go? I got the transplant. You know, it took several hours. Uh, laparoscopic surgery. I don't know if I had it at that time. That's not what I got. I'm a country boy. They cut me from here to yonder. Okay. <laughs> what year was this approximately? This was like uh, 1999. 
Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they cut you side to side, top to bottom, mm-hmm. open you up. Oh yeah. man. And so what happened? Um, they checked my my blood um, the next day, and uh, for 25 years they hadn't found the disease again. Wow. I'm the longest running uh, kidney transplant in Nashville with what was called a poor match. <laughs> That's incredible. My goodness. But after being on a machine for a year and a half, and then mm-hmm. if they cut you from here to yonder, I imagine recovering from that wasn't a walk in the park. Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't a walk in the park because it was a new set of circumstances. I was on 50 pills a day when I initially got the transplant. I had pills that were to help me with the side effects of other pills, Mm -hmm. literally 50 pills a day. Now, this come way down to about, I don't know, about 10 pills a day now, which is a lot to most people. But, yeah. And so, uh, but, yeah, my body was turning upside down, inside out from all those those pills. So I had to walk through that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, and and during that time, we had moved into what was called, you know, the projects. Mm -hmm. And that's when things... uh, started uh, changing. Mm-hmm. So what was your health care situation like in that you had to quit your job? Mm-hmm. So how did you have any ability to afford all of the surgery and pills? It sounds like losing your residence and moving to the projects. What was taking care of you during that time? Well, I was on disability, which is not a lot of money. And I, and um we uh, we were musicians. And my wife and I had worked uh, in churches. Churches would hire us to be, uh, you know, directors and musicians for for choirs. So we did that uh, for a long time. It's our longest running ministry is music. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, I'm a saxophone player. She's a keyboard player. Her uncle was Ray Charles's band leader for like 35 years. So it's <laughs> music all in her family. And so I. Uh, tricked her into going to an audition, you know, to play for a church early on. And she knew how to play one song, I'm Looking for a Miracle. That's the name of it. And we got a miracle because they hired us. <laughs> <laughs> so then where does the story go from there? I just, I'm hanging on every <laughs> conclusion of like... I have to know what's next. Okay, so you've got a new kidney mm-hmm. and you're looking now at a... Third chance at life, I suppose. You're looking for another miracle. (laughs) Yeah. So (laughs) what do you do there? You're coming out, going back to your place in the projects. What's the future? Well, the first day when we moved into the inner city community, I call it that, um, this girl that could not speak came to our door. And my wife gave her a piece of candy. We found out there were 50 children living on our street. What happens when you give one child a piece of candy? <laughs> they all come running. All of them. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we made a choir out of them, literally. Oh. <laughs> wow. We made a choir of those kids. We started tutoring the children, and that's when uh, life changed for us. As a matter of fact, parents would do drive-bys, not shooting, but dropping off the kids, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, some parents would drop the kids off as if we were a daycare. Like, who are these people? And I'm I'm totally serious. And so the kids were flooding our home. And that's how we got started with inner city ministry. Mm -hmm. Wow. So when did Elijah's Heart, when did Walk of Love come about? Well, during that time, when you got that many kids coming to your house, uh, y'all know kids get hungry. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. and they're not as pleasant when you don't feed them. Oh I my have gosh! Found. Yeah, and so we were giving them our food. We lived in the project, not outside now. And so my wife was like, "These kids are hungry. Why don't we take flyers throughout a three hundred plus home community and see what other children are hungry?" Now I know what I said made no sense. It's like putting a cart before the horse, right? But that's exactly what we did. Because we, we felt like we were led to see who else needed food, even though we didn't have it. So we took flyers and had a team go out with us. And of course, people called our number and said, we need food. So what did we do? We started going to businesses and churches that we did not know. You know, it's like, you know, the vacuum cleaner salesman. He said, we were trying to get food for children. That's literally what we did. Mm-hmm. And, people, and, and that's where the walk of love started. 
So we as a family have done Walk of Love, Mm -hmm. and it was just the best day to spend with you guys and your team and your family. But for those that haven't had that privilege, can you explain a little bit about what Walk of Love does? I sure can. We've got two types of Walk of Love. we got the door-to-door, which is how we started, and we got what we call the fresh market. Now, the door-to-door is when we take uh, resources, food, personal hygiene things, and other things, to entire communities. I mean every home in a 300, 400, 800 family community. That's what the walk of love is. Yeah. And so uh, <laughs> I'm talking about pulling in, you know, big box trucks and uh, semi-trucks. Yeah. And we didn't do that initially. We didn't go to the entire community initially. But within a couple of years, we did. And that's, that's the door-to-door. And that's uh, when we're using, uh, you know, uh, non-perishable food, you know, canned foods and stuff mm-hmm. like that. The fresh market is when we get uh, perishable foods. Foods, uh, is a lot of waste in our country. So foods uh, from like uh, Whole Foods, Panera Bread, places like that. What you would have been eating yesterday, we will get today, you know. Mm. And so we, we take that and we have a system of screening the food, yeah, and uh, bagging it. And we give it to the community and to the homeless. They come, in, they come to us on those, yeah. Where did the mission <clears throat> specifically addressing hunger come from? Because when you see the brokenness mm-hmm. that are in the inner city communities that quickly spiral into hopelessness, yeah. there's a lot of different things that you could choose to say, I want to focus on this or that. Where did hunger come from as your passion and mission to say, let me address this? Before you drive your car, no matter how uh, um, old it is or new, you have to have a key. And hunger is like the key to uh, reach the people. I can't go to a single mom's house. And I'm saying single mom because the majority of these uh, families are single moms, single grandmothers. I can't go in there and talk education. And we do that also if their children are hungry. No, they, they want to know what, you know, give me some food first, then I might listen to you. And so uh, we visited a single mom's house when we started this. She had six children. We went to the refrigerator. My wife went to the refrigerator. There was half of a store-bought pizza in there, and that's all they had. I went to the restroom. There was no toilet paper. There was a third of a Yellow Pages phone book in there, and that's what they were using as toilet paper. Now, if you ask me if this is unusual 20 years later, I'm going to tell you no. Because I'm in inner city America, not just Nashville. I've been all over the country. And we're talking about uh, people, women who have been through domestic abuse. And they move into uh, one of these apartments that were built in like 1940s, literally. And uh, they have almost nothing. No furniture, no cooking utensils. That's the type of uh, uh, poverty that we're talking about in inner city America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. One of the things that struck me in talking to you when we did Walk of Love is the longevity of your program. Can you speak a little bit about the consistency that Walk of yeah. Love has had in this neighborhood yeah. and why that has mattered, why that has resonated? It, it's so strange. It's just, I think I found a revelation in something. Kids are hungry tomorrow, too. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. They're hungry every day. Yeah. And so, yeah. Consistency uh, is just a necessity, and uh, it builds relationship. You know, if I come in there one and done, it, ju- it just tears the community apart. Cause it, and, it, and also, this brings down violence. A, a, a parent is going to feed their child some kind of way. When we come in with our program that's consistent, violence goes down. Yeah. Speak to that a little bit more in mm-hmm. that. We know in these communities that the weakest often are preyed upon, mm-hmm. and whether they're preyed on by gang leadership, drugs, getting arrested, there's a lot of ways for those already that have very little hope to be just eliminated from any chance of a future. Yeah. So your role 
over how many years have you been? It's, it's been this is our 20th year anniversary of this type of program, yeah. So for 20 years in the community, maybe speak to some of those relationships where you've had to befriend the good and the bad. Yeah. In order to accomplish what your goals are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, it, it's everybody knows there's gangs in these communities. You know, they hang out there, uh, and some of the well-known gangs, and some others. Some I call them homemade gangs. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and so uh, I uh, make connections uh, with the gang leaders, and and I have to because I'm feeding their children. Yeah, and uh, I need to be able to come in there uh, in peace. And, uh, and that's what's happened over the year. I get favor uh, to the point there have uh, been times where uh, we've told some volunteers not to go in specific areas with, you know, alone. And, and they, my grandmama used to say hard-headed. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> Give you one example. One a youth minister, one, one youth pastor went in an area by himself. And it's just an area where they deal drugs. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's just a reality, right? And so... Uh, this was a white guy. It's a totally black area. And they they either think he's a drug dealer or he's got a bunch of money and he's just in the wrong place, which is, you know, I don't know what the answer. I don't know if he got money or not, but he's a white guy in the wrong place without somebody with him, yeah. right? And so God, they were sticking him up, you know, put a gun on him, you know, give me all your money. And so what he did was say, um, I'm so sorry. I'm here with Papa Joe. And there's no accolades to me. But the guy put his gun away and just walked walked off. Wow. Because we we have a community over there. It's a family. So if you come in there with me, the police, the policemen from Nashville will tell you when we come in with our teams, there's peace during that time. Because, you know, because of our consistency, not just in the community that we are, but throughout Nashville. Yeah. You know, if Papa Joe's in here with the walk of love, they're in here to help us. And they're going to come back again. Yeah. And they're going to bring other people with them, not just the Hunger Relief Program. Mm. So tell me a little bit about Elijah's Heart, because you have two nonprofits going. Tell our audience a little bit about that one. Yeah, Elijah's Heart was a, a original nonprofit. And uh, Walk of Love, what's happening now, Walk of Love International is a nonprofit we're raising up because after the movie came out, after my movie came out, I uh, connected with people literally all over the world. Let's just say they connected with me because my movie's in 121 countries. Mm-hmm. And um, there have been orphanages that have people have started in Africa, you know, places, things like that. This one guy from Ghana, and I have a way not to answer the right question sometimes. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Okay, give you an example. This guy from Ghana called me, you know, right after our movie came out. He said, Papa Joe, Papa Joe. <laughs> I started an orphanage. I said, I'm gr- that, that's great. And, you know, we, who are you? You know, you know, he told me his name. And, well, he called me again recently, years later. He says, Papa Joe, we got like 300 kids now. Kids, we got that many kids. And so I'm an actor too, y'all, but I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. That's you know, great work right yeah. there. Yeah. He said, because I show your movie to people who got money, and they give me money for the kids. Okay. And so, yeah. Yeah, and so Elijah's heart got started from the last two verses of the Old Testament. It has to do with the hearts of the fathers given to the children and children to the fathers. Fatherlessness is one of the biggest reasons of what we see. So that's how we got that original name. And so since we started the Walk of Love and expanded so, people think our name is Walk of Love anyway, right? And so that mission of Walk of Love is just it's just going viral. You split that way. <laughs> So, Papa Joe, I've got a couple hard questions yeah. that are just my nature mm-hmm. is to be a fixer. Mm-hmm. And what Carly and I and our family saw when we were down there with you for Walk of Love just rips everybody's heart out. I mean, to see it reminds you in life. You have no problems. <laughs> the things that you think are issues are not issues. People would give anything for your issues to be their issues. Yes. And there's this concept of you know a white savior wanting to come into communities and you know volunteer and throw money at it. And there's really good literature out there that says you know 
what happens when your helping actually hurts? And I struggle because I hear these stories, you know, using you know phone books for toilet paper and starving kids. And I want to end the podcast and go and help. But I wonder from your perspective how you view that, because I think I can address a community of a couple hundred people that are hungry today, but like you said, they're going to be hungry tomorrow. So how do you speak to people like Carly and I and the world that hears this, is horrified by it, but doesn't really know what to do about it? Well, uh, thank God I'm, I'm a nerd. And, uh, you yeah. know, I like systems. And when I was younger, I was uh, an athlete. They called me a jock, and some people called me a nerd. So I am pretty much was a jerk. And so, so it's a new thing. <laughs> but uh, I say that because uh, I, I like systems. And so, uh, like I said, the, the hunger relief is the key. Hunger relief involves clothes, too, because kids can grow out of clothes, okay? And so that, that, that's step one. And that, you can set up a consistent way where people can get that. For example, uh, most of the families are on SNAP program, food stamps, so to say. Food stamps are only going to last two to three weeks at the most, okay? And so what we would do, we would supplement for that final week, let's put it that way. Yeah, so in a 30-day in a month, yeah. the, the food stamps are going to get them through 14 to 21 days, but yeah. then there's a 10 to 15-day stretch where they've got nothing. Right, and the, and the door-to-door walk of love was a supplement for that. Okay. You know, what we do every week is just to help anybody because it's homeless people, too, that we help, okay? So systematically, even just looking at time during that month, you got they, right now they got SNAP benefits and they got the supplemental food, which is what you know an organization like us do, and we just do it on a mass basis. Okay, so that's covered fairly well. And then, okay, that, that's giving a child a fish. We want to teach them how to fish, and what, what you lead. I to. love that. Yeah. Right, and so uh, educationally, you know, um, there needs to be something uh, uh, that teaches the kids, uh, like um, let's just say literacy. The biggest challenge uh, with school is being able to read well. And you can ask any of the teachers in the inner city. If you can read well, you can probably do fairly well in school. But most of the kids can't. So I would bring in literacy programs. Like, uh, for example, uh, Dollar General has a foundation, you know, for example, one of the ones. Uh, and it, it's very successful because the kids learn to read better and they do better in school. If they do that, they can get an education. They can go to college. If they don't go to college, they can go to some, you know, some other type of school, you know, at least to get some kind of uh, a trade. Yeah. The other thing, I have to introduce them to people like you, people who, uh, who had ambition and had a way to get ahead. But they need to see you, that you actually exist, a you, a type of you. Because mm-hmm. all they're seeing is mainly the drug dealers who have money. So I gotta, what do I bring in? I bring in people who have been successful, introduce them to the children, to build their aspirations. So you got the food, you got education is gonna, you know, literacy, different types of education is gonna enhance what they're doing. Okay, and they've got something to uh, to aspire to, you know. And I see you. Well, I want to be like them. I don't have to be a drug dealer here over here and get in trouble. You see how we're putting all this together? Yeah. yeah. I think that makes so much sense because mm-hmm. the individuals that you meet, they each have their own stories, mm-hmm. uh, and some of them are just stories that represent the face of brokenness Mm -hmm. that feels in some ways irrecoverable Mm -hmm. for a future for them. And it seems as though part of Walk of Love's mission is to say, for some, we're going to serve you by feeding you and making sure that there is some ounce of dignity and humanity that we're able to offer you. But for the kids, Mm -hmm. where really our future is held, we're going to feed them too, but try to equip some of them with the chance to be able to get out of the kind of gravitational orbit of the inner city, which claims most 
of those that get in that orbit. Yeah. It's not a good percentage for what comes out of there. And I think that's such an important message because what I was getting at some earlier too is that if people that are not like you, that are living in the community with every ounce of passion, you know, you're there, you're a fixture, everyone knows you, you're able to make lasting change rather than be a flash in the pan that appears one day, is gone in the next, and reinforces the, the truth that while most people might care for a Saturday, they don't really care. And I think you show a really incredible example of how care done consistently can really generate results. Yeah. And let me, let me say, let me, uh, we actually don't live in the community. People think we do because I'm yeah. there so much. We don't metaphorically live. Metaphorically, yeah. Maybe yeah, the yeah way we to did say live it. in there, but you know, so metaphorically, you're right because I'm there so much. But another thing, uh, Spencer, is uh, the walk of love is a door, so to speak, for other things to come in. People are afraid to go into inner city America. Yeah. And so uh, the door meaning, you know, we'll do an event on site on the spot. It might be hot dogs, hamburgers, and the community will come out. Hungry people eat. I'm saying that because they're going to come out for the food. Mm -hmm. But when they come out, we'll have canopy set up with other organizations that can, you know, bring other types of resources to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how are you, you said you've been traveling a lot and you've connected with people all over the world because of your movie. How is the Walk of Love influencing other community programs, not just in Nashville? Yeah, um, the Walk of Love is like a cookie cutter. You know, anybody can do it and you just have to, you just have to know how. If you know how to do it, <clears throat> then it can be taken anywhere. And we've had volunteers from all over the country, some from other parts of the world. There was a lady that came this summer, if you ask my team. She was from China, and uh, she lives here in America. But she saw my movie in China. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> she didn't even know it was a real Papa Joe she was coming to see. <laughs> yeah. But she said, I learned so much, you know, from watching the movie. And so that's why I'm giving back. She didn't even know it was me. Okay? Now, ask the question again. I told you out of the way I'm not <laughs> Answer the question, no, Carly. I'm curious. Yeah, I'm how sorry. you've seen a walk of love impact these types of programs in other cities. Yeah. You say there's a cookie cutter. Are you guys mentoring other community yes, programs, maybe in the state and outside the state? Yeah, on my on my site, PapaJoe.org, you'll see me on the Good Morning America interview. Uh, interview. They had me on their show just for this, mm -hmm. just to talk about the walk of love, so it can kind of you know ignite a fire, you know, nationally. And so I get on Zoom calls with people all over the country, just showing them what our system is. And, you know, and I've been able to visit some places in the country, you know, to do the walk of love form. And they just they just just run with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was a father of eight. Spence and I have long conversations about what <laughs> it looks like to raise kids with a generational impact. Right. Like we're mm -hmm. trying to raise our kids to be generous and want to do hard things that serve other people, not just themselves. Mm -hmm. How have you seen this life's work impact your kids and what they're up to now? Well, you definitely know a tree by the fruit that it bears, right? Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to make sure, Lord, please let us bear fruit, you know, through our children. We want to have a legacy with our children and other children that come and volunteer. And so um, our kids have grown up in this. It's better to give than receive. They know that. And so that's what they do. They're team leaders now. You know, they, they are better than I am in a lot of this stuff. I don't have to show up because my team and my kids, you know, you know they, they can do it too. And so, uh, like I said, it's a legacy. And, you know, and they, they, they teach others what we do. So it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I saw your kids in action. It was really impressive. Mm. Enjoyed that. Yep. Papa Joe, we've had the opportunity to have – legislators on our program, people that are making the policy decisions that really impact your community that you're serving in a way that if you have the opportunity to speak to some of those legislatures, the legislators, what would you say? Because I hear various call-outs that you say, we've got 
these structures built in the 1940s, I mean, approaching 100 years old. <laughs> We've got a SNAP program that lasts 14 to 21 days, but not 30 days. A lot of other pieces that you've called out, education, recidivism. Can you talk about what policies you see working well or policies that really don't work well that could really serve this community? Yeah, whatever the policy it is, it has to trickle down to the individual. I have spoken, I've been called in, I was at Housing Colorado. It's a national, it's a, a state conference they have. I was a keynote speaker there. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor of Florida called me in. I spoke to a big crowd. I've, I've been in conversations like this. Um, whatever the policy is, can I go to one of the residents and ask them, has this affected you? You hear, you hear how I put that? Because policies sometimes have a way of, of getting funds into the community, but it might not touch directly that individual. You know, like, for example, I know we were having a conversation privately about uh, these devices that have the blue lights on them to kind of deter, uh, you know, violence. I would bring that in. That would be one of the things that's, a, that's mm -hmm. one of the foremost things I would do because of pe people are afraid to come out of their homes because of violence in the inner city of America a lot. Okay, that's one of the things I, I would make sure that's there because that's affecting them directly. And very low cost. I mean, yeah. on the spectrum of things very that low cost. is super low cost. I talked to, you know, we've been talking about food. I, I'm going to say again, if, if a policy doesn't touch the basic necessities, then, you know, what have we done? Because the people are still fighting, they're still stealing, they're still selling stuff. At a, at a store that they were given through a nonprofit just to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. I would look at the basic necessities first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's a, yeah. So any policy has to trickle down to that individual. Mm -hmm. If you saw changes to the SNAP program where the funds available for food was meaningfully increased, whatever that number is, if we just put ourselves in that world for a second and say legislative change happens in 2025 where SNAP is meaningfully expanded and Walk of Love specifically as a hunger fighter mm -hmm. is diminished in some way because hunger is not as big of a challenge in uh -huh. Napier Sudicum. Yeah. What's your next thing that you say – all right, I've turned the key, to mm -hmm. use your analogy, of hunger. I finally got this addressed in my community. What's the next step that you would take? <clears throat> if I can use a quick analogy, um, let's, just, let's just say a field is out there that's a landmine field, okay? To, to, uh, to get through that, that landmine field, get from one side to another, you need some kind of information. You need, you need knowledge. You first need to communicate with whoever laid the mines. Or you need to communicate with whoever has successfully, successfully went through that minefield. Yeah. Okay? So I would talk to the individuals out in the field with those people. Okay? That, that's, that's the first thing I, I, would, I would do. And if, if it's somebody like me who's been out in that landmine, number one, communication. I know a lot of people don't know what I'm about to say. I would put some type of money into telephones. I know this sounds crazy, but telephones that don't end at the end of the month, and then you got to get another one. Because one of our biggest problems is communicating with the parents to come out and do anything. Remember, I'm in, I'm in there all the time. Give you an example. Our summer program, we would uh, we'd get a spreadsheet, a list of names. We had, I don't know, about 300, literally like 300 names would be part of a summer program. Uh, two weeks later, maybe, maybe 60% of those families had the same number. Wow. Because if you can't afford food, can you afford a telephone? Sure. In war, what the first thing they try to do is kill the communication system. Well, it is a war in inner city America because the mothers don't have a phone. A basic thing that's simple, and you would never know that unless you're out there. 
So I would put some money into phones that stick around, you know, that they don't have to try to replace. That way they can communicate. If I can communicate with you, I can tell you about the other resources that are coming to you. Mm-hmm. I think that's exactly, <laughs> Papa Joe, yeah. that's the answer is mm-hmm. often the solutions come from those that are living it every day. It's yeah. not an outside huge change of like, we've got to do all these things. It's like, hey, Spencer, how about we have a telephone and a number that stays the same for more than two weeks at a time? And that has reaches into so many respects that for schools, right, for getting kids to show up and keep showing up to school, they don't show up, you got a phone number, and you at least have one chance to be able to try to get them. But if you don't have a working number... And that's for real. I'm talking about mothers with six, seven, eight children. It's common. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I would be remiss if I didn't ask for any other ideas. I know I didn't ask you to come prepared, but I just would feel awful. Is there anything yeah, else? Do you have that... any more fruit, more gems <laughs> that you just need to get out? I mean, that was an incredible idea, and that's okay if that's the one for now. But is there any other ones that you'd say, all right, if we can get that done, here's another? Because that just feels so doable, Papa Joe. Like the phones feels doable. Yes. Oh, you know, to get here, it's been such a challenge to get past that one, to even get to, that's, that's like A, you can't even get to B without that one. You know, so yeah, getting a communication line, you know, that that's like step one. And then I would teach them, uh, uh, you know, just the, about the digital world. Okay. Yeah, because if you don't have a phone, you probably don't have a computer. I was going to say, if you don't have a phone, you don't have internet. And so much of schools and next level exactly. learning, you have to be able to get online. So that's When COVID hit, <clears throat> they got internet in the inner city communities. But, you know, that policy, whatever, has ended. And so, yeah. So I don't know how to get an internet. You, you, very few people have internet. So imagine you don't have a phone or, an, or internet. How did they get the internet? Was it Wi-Fi that they set up during? Yeah, COVID? they set up Wi-Fi during during COVID because you know you you had uh, you they had to do school remotely. Yeah. And then once COVID was declared over, did they pull the Wi-Fi out of the Bingo. communities? Mm-hmm. You win. Wow. And they lost. <laughs> yeah. And are they were they school issued devices? I guess laptops that they were bringing. Yeah, home? they were at the time during COVID. During yeah. COVID. Yeah, but now. Yeah, they've uh, we gotta get some new policy in there to get uh, to get Wi-Fi again. Can I ask you? You talked about literacy and the need. Are you guys addressing that right now, or is that something that you're hoping to address in yo, the future? Yo, is yes and no. <laughs> you- <laughs> yeah, that's I why like I was that. like, "What was that?" Yeah, no, okay. I, say, I use that one a lot. Yeah, yeah. that should be on your T-shirt. Yeah. Yo, yes and yes, no. because. Because communication line is so hard to do that. Sure. We've been working so hard to get communication going consistently. It's hard to keep a literacy program together if you don't have phones and Internet. And so, yeah, we've done it, and we're still trying. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's here and there because you got to, yeah. And I think that's the consistency element that is there, too, is that if we know the world in which we live in is that phones are not much of a reality, Internet's not much of a reality, but there's a literacy program that has been showing up every week at the same time on whatever day of the week, and they've been doing it for three months, all of a sudden, now the community has enough time to spread it word of mouth. Yeah. I mean, that's ultimately the only thing that's left. It's Mm -hmm. word of mouth and flyers that can get distributed, but doing it for one weekend or two weekends and then being gone, I can appreciate why an organization would say, well, we didn't get a lot of people showing up or we didn't see a lot of impact. And it has to go deep and be sustained. And partners like yourself is what makes that even possible, not only from a safety standpoint, I mean, so practical there, yeah. but from a community standpoint and knowing what has to be addressed, who is your legacy 
if you get hit by the proverbial bus tomorrow, your decades of life work, yeah. who's there in the gap? Yeah, we've got we've got a team of um, of people who have been with us for years, and uh, and we got some young and you know and some older, and so they keep the ball rolling in what we do, and I've trained people all over the place. Mm-hmm. So the principles that we're talking about, you know, I've been training people for years, man. Mm. The basic foundational stuff that we've been talking about on this podcast that people don't know that's right in our face that people just don't know. Yeah, I've been training people for years, and we continue to do it. Yeah. And we have a team that, that will carry that on. Mm-hmm. Just educationally, Papa Joe, for Napier Sudicum, that's a community that has about 800 Yeah. Residents or buildings? <clears throat> it has 800 uh, buildings, uh, okay. apartments. It's the largest inner city community in the state of Tennessee like that. Mm-hmm. So when you think about other communities in middle Tennessee, or if you look wider at the whole state of Tennessee, mm-hmm. how prevalent is a community like this? Would you say, Spencer, this is one community out of 100 that have the exact same story? Is it one out of a thousand? Help me understand the scope and the magnitude of the problem in Tennessee. Yeah, well, here in Nashville, if I looked at Nashville first, <clears throat> you've got Napier Sudicum, you've got what's called the traditional homes run by the housing authority. In every city, in major city in our nation, you have a housing authority. And uh, they're responsible for most of these communities like this. And you've got some, uh, some uh, 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 income-based communities that are not, of course, housing authority. And they're scattered throughout Nashville. They're scattered throughout inner-city America. And so with the traditional homes, the red brick ones like that y'all got to visit, um, there's about six of them, you know, with about, you know, three to 400 uh, families per home. And then you've got the other ones that have been rebuilt but are still income-based. Okay, and you got, you know, maybe five or six of those. And so, but yeah, there there could maybe be two dozen or so in Nashville scattered throughout the city. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just in the the ones I told you, the traditional homes, it could be like 10,000 uh, people in just those five that are traditional, not, not counting the other MDH uh, housing authority ones. So it's thousands, man. Mm-hmm. What happens when you look at a city like Nashville where – the growth of the city mm-hmm. has transformed communities that used to look one way mm-hmm. and feel one way and have certain statistics and now looks real different. And you see inner city communities that once had a development that's gone and gentrification happens mm-hmm. yeah. to where these families are displaced can you talk about a story or two of really saying, Spencer, it's one thing to just see it as the growth of Nashville, but here's real life, like what this does yeah. to families when they're displaced. Now we're jumping into the motel homeless. Because when uh, buildings uh, uh, where you got impoverished, people are torn down. The people have to go somewhere. Yeah. You, the homelessness the homelessness is an epidemic, not just in California where you see a lot about it, but in Nashville and other cities too. Uh, homelessness has really grown in our city. Um, uh, but you've got the motel homeless, and that's what I call them. That's what a lot of people call them. Uh, these, uh, they don't have a residence other than trying to pay for a motel. They're not in a motel, they're in the car. And that's really shot up in Nashville, Tennessee. So yeah. if Napier Sudicum was leveled tomorrow and they said, all right, this is closed and done, there's 800 families, obviously that's not going to happen. But if that was to happen tomorrow, yeah. then their only option is sleep in their car. Many of them will go homeless, try to find some other community that has space. Yeah, but well, it's good. good yeah. uh, the, the waiting list is long for other communities like Napier. So there's not even space. You can't, so you can't even get in. Yeah, and so yeah, it's a, it's a very limited to where you can go for income based homes, and so they end up cousins move in with cousins cousins illegally, you know, like that, which causes a, a big issue. What would you say to someone that has never worked with the Walk of Love, 
that had no idea that some of these problems persisted, what is the one thing you wish that if you had the giant megaphone and everyone had to hear you say something, what do you wish people knew? I wish that they were aware of the issues that we talked about here. I believe when people are made aware, you know, then they know how to help. People don't know how to help. Mm. They don't even know there's a reason to help because we typically go about our life day to day, and uh, we have our routine. You can drive by these communities and not even notice them. But it's thousands of children and families, yeah, that are going through this. So I would be, I would, I would make it aware. I will put on a poster what's going on, and please come on out. It's going to be fun. I would have people uh, who have big hearts like you. I, I would videotape you more and more, put you on a billboard and say, "I was there, y'all," because they will listen to you. I was there. Come, come on out. Let's go help these kids. Yeah, they might not listen to me, you know, but they will listen to you. Mm -hmm. That's a really powerful message and Mm -hmm. exactly what Carly and I Mm -hmm. and our girls, as we drove home, it put life in a really different perspective that breaks your heart. And I think what's so appreciated in your message is there's not an ounce of victimhood, of blaming, of excuses. You are all practicality. And to be clear, we could spend plenty of time to (laughs) talk about any of that stuff, but you're using your time to say, here is how you help. It starts with being aware there's a problem, Mm -hmm. and then there's actually some really achievable solutions, things that advance the ball forward, because what I see in this is there are generational cycles that are going to have to be broken. Exactly. There are some people that are in line at Walk of Love that you and I both know are unemployable and mm-hmm. will likely be unemployable for the balance of their lives. Yeah. And to say anything different is not being intellectually honest exactly. for the majority, but in that same line are those kids and the potential to say this has been a life that was in some ways sacrificed, their parents, their grandparents, for the future of their kids, to be able to give them a chance to make something of themselves in life. And you are laying out a really clear and consistent pathway to do that. And I just can't tell you how proud I am to meet you, Papa Joe. Your story of overcoming, coming through prison, coming through kidney failure, and managing to have a story that to spend a second around you is to see God's love, to (laughs) see someone that is living for not this place, this is not our home, it inspires me to no end, Papa Joe, and I just want to say thank you. And thank you for giving me a, a, the privilege to, uh, to share, man, what's going on. We're going to shout it from the rooftop and as loud as we possibly can so that people can hear and learn.